Okay, we are back live after a couple of technical issues. <laughs> we are live from Brussels, more specifically from the Bruegel office. Uh, probably the most prominent uh, economic think tank in Brussels. And I'm here with Giuseppe Porcaro, who is the head of communication. And uh, But we're not going to talk about your Bruegel business today. No. We're going to talk about another project that you are running. Let's get into the picture a bit more. We, are, we have to be a bit cozy. Yeah, we, we need to be close close to each other. I think we both need to go mm -hmm. to the, to the hairdresser uh, today, yes. at some point. Yes. Giuseppe, you are the head of communication on Bruegel, and in your spare time you're writing a novel called Disco Sour. It sounds like a cocktail. So the novel is set in a civil war ravaged Europe, where nation states collapsed, and a rump EU just about prevents anarchy, and Tinder-like apps replace elections. Fascinating. It is a story about, correct me if I'm wrong, Bastian Balth uh, Balth Balthazar. Balthazar Bucks, so BBB, a space lover, a smartphone addict, a young political leader on the verge of a breakdown. Giuseppe, so you're working on this book and also in a, in a couple of weeks you will be presenting your work in an event here in Brussels called Eurovision. Tell us more about the book and the upcoming event. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, first of all, Marco, for this uh, great opportunity of having this coffee together of course. from the office in our, in our break. And then uh, especially uh, uh, nice to have a break from uh, all the economic uh, issues that we are dealing with today. <laughs> Uh, with, with something that is more fictional and, and, and more imaginative as, as the book I'm writing. As you said, uh, it's a book that uh, I started to, uh, to work on be, uh, set in an imaginary history uh, line okay. where, coming back to the economics, uh, after the financial crisis of 2008, uh, instead of, uh, um, let's say, instead of, of seeing the... Uh, more and more predominance of, uh, of, of taking back uh, of the narrative uh, from, from nation states, actually nation states get to collapse because of a civil war. And a civil war that is caused by the burst of the housing bubble starting in Greece and then uh, going all over the continent and basically uh, uh, changing the geopolitical aspect of, uh, of, of, of Europe. Well, that's fantastic. I mean, it is fictional, but it is based on recent events, actually, that have created uh, turmoil in Europe, economically, politically. So, I mean, this scenario that you're playing in the future, how likely do you think is going to happen? Well, how likely? I, I hope it's not going to happen, because, of course, I hope that there is not going to be a war in Europe, of course. But what I've been playing quite a lot around is uh, the reverse kind of scenarios that, uh, that we are seeing constantly in the reality. Sure. So, uh, I w as I was saying before, the rhetoric of the nation state coming back predominantly in Europe versus how it would have been if the financial crisis, instead of bringing this rhetoric of the nation state, would have brought the opposite kind of move. So basically bringing... Uh, more uh, of, a, of a European, I mean the blame game has been played against uh, the European institutions. Uh, in, in the case of the book, the blame game about everything that happened with the financial crisis is put on the nation state. So I've been playing a little bit with this kind of, uh, of, of fictional reality which could have been real if maybe the narratives uh, um, operating on the ground would have been different. That's fantastic. I mean, I, I'm so intrigued and I cannot wait to see the final product. Now, you have done, you have run uh, an event uh, some time ago that was called Tinder Politics, right? Indeed. Like, okay, what was the, um, the main content of the event? What did you discuss? What was the audience like? Tell me more about this Tinder Politics. Yeah, so uh, beside the setting that we've been just describing about uh, the civil war in Europe, that's just about the context where, context where the event, the, the book is taking place. But basically the core of the book is, uh, is a very personal story. As you mentioned before, uh, is the story of Bastian. He's a young political leader who is on the verge of a breakdown because he has been uh, uh, going through a series of breakups 
and uh, at the same time one of these breakups up actually happens via an app which is called the breakup shop which uh, basically uh, sends him a notification in the middle of a high political meeting he's attending he sends them a notification that uh, the person with whom uh, he was with uh, basically was breaking up with uh, with him wow. and basically deleting uh, deleting immediately from his phone all the photos the media contacts wow. uh, the social media profiles of uh, of his partner uh, straight away so uh, I start to play a little bit with this but then it goes a little bit deeper because Bastian has to fight against uh, the the bad guy of, of the situation, you always have a bad guy in, uh, in, in the story, and the bad guy is basically the CEO of a company who is trying to sell to the governments an app like Tinder that would replace elections in the name of uh, uh, direct democracy, in the name of, let's say, uh, populism 6.0, you know. So uh, uh, there is this kind of parallelism, and that's where what I call Tinder politics. Back to your question, yes. this parallelism because between uh, a certain biopolitics that is being played at the moment with dating apps and how dating apps are affecting our daily life and our our personal politics, and how. Uh, potentially technology and uh, uh, everything that is happening around uh, the discourse of, uh, of, of uh, yeah, populism or direct democracy or let's, let's throw away all political parties and so on is playing around a certain idea of politics that is um, or of political uh, arena that is uh, closer and closer to a simplification that uh, that is uh, that is basically swiping right or swiping left uh, for uh, for your favorite uh, political option rather than yes. your politician. Okay, I mean now the dating apps market, you know, is not just about Tinder. There is a number of apps that provide this kind of services, which are frankly very popular. Uh, definitely in Europe, I don't know about uh, all around the world. Definitely in America, these are just apps that have become part. Of our daily life. Now, how? I mean, this is still a very recent development. You know, uh, Tinder is a very recent product. How do you think that dating apps are affecting our human interactions? So, do you think that people now with these apps just want everything now? And so, this basically modifies the way we interact humanly, you know? And uh, how much is this affecting also decisions related to politics? Let me explain. So, definitely this uh, market is affecting the way we interact with people, okay? There isn't any more the seduction game where you go maybe to a bar or to a social gathering, you make a move. In this case, that part basically gets skipped mm -hmm. with a match. So, two people that match uh, an algorithm basically and uh, they like each other physically because that's the first input you get somehow. How does this affect our human interactions and how will this affect making political decisions like voting for a party? Do you think these apps will have an impact in that as well? What do you think? So that's a very good question. First of all, let me, uh, let me elaborate more on the Please. first part of, of, your, uh, of your analysis which is about how this is affecting our daily relations or our daily Wait, approach yes, to yes. Uh, our daily approach to dating uh, that's definitely uh, something that you can uh, you can see from different angles I mean one can say and and this is pretty much true that uh, uh, dating apps are just facilitating are just a medium and they are not actually affecting the substance of what could right. happen yes so you you could definitely argue that uh, going to a bar and hook up uh, doesn't require a very sophisticated, uh, uh, I mean, sometimes it, it could, but it doesn't necessarily require a sophisticated uh, approach in terms of uh, uh, a, lengthy, uh, a lengthy conversation or, okay. or, or real dating, you know. So from this point of view, we'll, this we'll, could we'll be... We'll ask the audience. Yeah, <laughs> the, 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 this, this, could, this could be seen as uh, 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 very similar to the fast dating that you might have on Tinder, on Grindr, on Happen, or whatever it is. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a certain kind of uh, code and language 
that is uh, developed within each of the dating apps that is changing the way we approach the, the potential uh, partner according to our needs and our objectives. So as you say, there are such an array of dating apps uh, on the market that, for, for instance, uh, this is also reflected a little bit in the book, actually, because the, um, the, the, the protagonist is a bisexual guy, likes girls, he likes boys, uh, he likes different things. So according to what is on the moment his needs and desire, he basically uses that app or this of other course, app. Uh, so, for example, if, if you want to have a more romantic date, you might m m be more prone to use something like mm -hmm. Tinder. Not necessarily, I know, but, but maybe, but if you want something that is more fast, you, you can get a very m more direct tool for, for that. So as you say, uh, dating apps are, are kind of putting in the market um, a series of options. And what is changing is the way the users or the consumers of, uh, of the dating market, let's put it like that in a very economical, <laughs> in, a, in, in very economical terms, uh, that is the way it basically, this kind of economical terms is the way it is perceived, bo both by the, let's say, the makers of the apps, but also by the end users. That starts to see dating more and more as something that should be efi uh, efficiency gained, I you see, know? I see. Yes. Uh, and, and, and therefore, somehow, from being just a medium, so it's true that you might have a very nice date and end up with the with the girl or the man of your, or whoever gender it is of, of, of your life uh, through, uh, through an encounter that has been generated by a dating app. That's, that's not up to a judgment. But it is true that uh, it is not just a medium, it's generating some sort of uh, new behaviors. There are a lot of people, for instance, that uh, would have gone out to, uh, to hook up with people but basically they might not do this effort anymore, you know, you go and uh, you go out up to a certain point, if you see that the situation is not uh, brilliant, let's say in the club or in the bar where you go, you don't put much more effort than before, you just say, but okay, instead of spending my time until 6 o'clock in the morning and maybe going home alone, I just go home at 2 o'clock, right. everyone, everyone will be connected at 2 o'clock and will be wanting the same thing that I want, and uh, I might um, okay. go. So I think that this affects the, the relation. Just to conclude on the link to politics, I mean, we've been seeing a change in how political campaigns have been conducted sure. since, since the 90s, since, uh, since when we have been uh, starting to, uh, to use new technology yes, and yes. instant messages. So I think that even in, in, in political campaigns, all these uh, kind of uh, psychological uh, analysis is definitely taken into account when we speak about instant gratification. Yes. And there is definitely something in instant gratification that is common both in dating apps and in the way political campaigns are being designed at the moment. I totally agree on this point. So, uh, with this uh, fast-paced uh, information overload that we have to go through on a daily basis, people get used to wanting everything and wanting it now, do you think that might affect the, let's say, short-sightedness of political parties that to win the elections, you gotta make people happy. So you have to give them something quick, fast, but this will make you lose sight of the longer-term picture, let's say. So now we see that populist parties especially are very good at doing this because uh, with their rhetoric, with their aggressive communication, they might make people happy or they might convince people to join their thoughts simply by changing their language and using something aggressive or um, suggesting very direct and fast policies like let's stop immigration or let's get out of the EU or um, let's do something radical right now. Mm -hmm. And people react to that positively because they see an immediate reaction to their will. But do you think this might affect, you know, the vision on the long term of political parties because they need to make everybody happy and this might cause, you know, benefit, this might cause losing benefits on the long term because politics and policies is, can be slow sometimes and to implement solid policies you might need time. Do you think that political parties need to find a balance between that? So they have to win the elections, making people happy. 
but also they don't have to lose sight on long-term girls uh, goals. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> on long-term girls. <laughs> Speaking about <Sorry>. Tinder, <laughs> exactly. It was a slip of tongue. Yeah, but especially for instance, thinking about Europe. You know, the European project uh, is something that we just celebrated uh, 60 years of the European yeah. Union. Now, how can Europe? deal with this issue, with this new challenge of making people happy fast, but also not lose sight of goals on the long term? That's a very tough question, <laughs> but uh, I think that your analysis uh, is exactly what I have in mind and what I had in mind while, while uh, setting up the political background for, for the actual novel. What you're saying, I mean, it was a Freudian, Fro Freudian uh, slip, but uh, to a certain extent you could, <laughs> you could compare, you could compare a one-night stand of winning the elections with a long-term relation. So, I uh, love this parallel, please tell me more I about mean, it. I mean, and, the, and, and this is something that, uh, for instance, Bastian, uh, all, all along the, the, um, the, the novel, at some point uh, bangs into that, you know, and uh, even like jokingly, Uh, starts to make this comparison between uh, uh, basically trying to get laid and trying to win the elections. You know, <laughs> there is this wall, this wall tension that tries to come back all the time in a subtle way, of course. But uh, but you know, it's not Fifty Shades of Grey. It's, uh, of course, it's something of course. else. Uh, what you say basically uh, is like, how do you balance a long term a long term vision or long term relation with uh, a world of instant gratification? This is exactly the question that. Uh, political parties should ask themselves, because it's easy to get instant gratification, but as you say, it mo all, almost most of the time it's either uh, for um, very short-term kind of policies that brings a short-term gain, and but in the long run they are not strategic, okay. or even worse, uh, Uh, they are simply not 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 possible to implement. You know, like there are things that that have been promised that are simply uh, not not just sustainable, but just not uh, but not these realistic. These promises might make you win the elections. This promise might That, make you win the elections. For example, the NHS case of the Brexit exactly. campaign. So, uh, instant gratification, promising promising more money for exactly. NHS, but where this money is going is going to go? And actually, this was a fake news, indeed. So, going back to this, I think that the real challenge for the political parties would be to, uh, uh, to work on the instant gratification on a different level than the populist mm. one, which, uh, which works on the grassroots uh, uh, kind of mobilization. I might be a very old-fashioned person from this point of view, but I think that the, the, the real um, difficulty is to gain the trust in the long run. And going back to the analysis that we were making about saying that political parties already from the 90s, when they had to design political campaigns, they started to design political campaigns as a, a, a form of entertainment, right. you know? And this has been pushing and pushing and pushing by uh, neglecting what was the form of very uh, labor-intensive and, uh, and, and constant work that was done on the ground by, uh, you know, it's not that political parties 30 years ago or like decision-making process 30 years ago was extremely different from what it is now in, in, Western, in Western democracy. But what was true is that uh, the, the, the kind of uh, level of discuss, political discussion at the grassroots level that now happens maybe on Facebook or happens on, the, on, you know, on, yes. on social media or just at the bar, Uh, this kind of this kind of uh, of discussions, uh, the political parties were actually present in this kind of uh, in, in this kind of situations because they were close to the citizens because they were uh, local sections that were active that they were doing activities they were doing social activities you know so the the party as such was seen much more closer to the citizen of course, of course, yeah. even if. In reality, the decision-making process ex was exactly the same. So I think that uh, from the 90s on, there has been this two ways movement. One of instant gratification in political campaigns, and two, seeing, uh, 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 seeing more and more uh, uh, the, the, the goal of catching as many people as possible of different kind of views, 
So the political parties themselves lost their identity and people started to uh, uh, not feeling connected anymore uh, in one way or another. So these two things basically uh, started this vicious circle of uh, hollowing out what was the role of the political parties back then and then gave away to this kind of populist that... Uh, that are riding the waves of Tinder politics. Okay, well, that, that was a fantastic analysis. I have two more questions. First of all, now, in this world that you describe right now, which is going toward, the you know, in the future, to be even more, uh, even faster, and even require more uh, instant gratification. Now, people that do communication, so campaigners, communication managers, people dealing with press, with social media, now, I... I this is my thought. So since we are in a world of over-digitalization, so we are so used to getting notifications all the time, uh, messages, Twitter interactions, and, uh, Facebook notifications, and so on and so forth, what I see is that professionals in our field, when they actually make a human contact, so when they actually, let's say, they go for the meeting instead of the LinkedIn message, or they go for the phone call instead of the text, I think they are more effective because since we are so saturated with digital interactions, mm -hmm. when we get a human interaction, that makes an impression. This is how I feel. I feel that uh, communication professionals have, can exploit this leverage because we are, so, we, you know, we are even getting used not to call anymore. So when you get a phone call, it makes a bigger impression than a digital interaction. Do you think that is the case? Or do, so do you think that communication professionals need to exploit even more the digital world or they have to exploit this leverage of making themselves different and going back to human interactions in order to make really an impression towards the people they want to influence or target or communicate to? What is your take on that? My take is something in between, in the sense that uh, uh, certainly human interaction um, acquires a totally new meaning that they used to be. So uh, it means that it's a very, very kind of special relation that you are building up with your uh, target audience or the person that you are trying to convince for whatever kind of yes. reason. So exactly for this reason, it has to be used uh, very smartly and very strategically. It's true that it can get you much more results, but exactly for this reason, in the f because of the fact that uh, you are totally bombed by uh, information daily and, and many other things, in order to stand up and not being a phone call like, I make you an example, for example, there are, there are a lot of these kind of uh, um, obscure financial companies that all of a sudden calls the reception of your office, I don't know if it happens to you, but it happens to me, and all of a sudden the receptionist here, because they are very good in, in saying I want to speak with Giuseppe Borcaro, the head of communication, and you know, so it looks that it's not advertisement, it looks like a real professional call, so I, I get the receptionist to, uh, to, to pass me the phone call, and then after not even two seconds I understand that this person is trying to sell me something. Okay. And that is the most annoying thing in the world, you know. So I think that professional communicators need to use this tool on a, with very, very, very uh, care. And uh, they need to build a relation with the person. So I think that uh, uh, it is all about treating uh, your target audience, your person, as a unique, uh, you know, a unique person, that the person is feeling that there is a tailored approach in the kind of communication he or she is receiving uh, course, from, yeah. from, from you and therefore making the best out of this world where we are, where there is uh, you know, this kind of balance between instant gratification and uh, deeper human long-term relation. Okay. Last question. So 20th of April, Eurovision at the Cultural Center Bruegel. This is a coincidence. A coincidence, yes. In Brussels, the guests I see will be Giacomo Filibeck, Ryan Heath, the famous, the, the senior EU correspondent for Political Europe, uh, Denis Maxi Maximov, co-founder of Avenir Institute, and uh, Teresa, Teresa Koss. Now, what can we expect from this event? So, this is uh, an attempt to bring uh, uh, part of the universe of the book in, uh, uh, in reality, in the discussion that we are having here in Brussels, 
It is a sort of experiment because I have not finished to write the book yet. So I'm uh, kind of seeking through this kind of events, uh, not just inspiration, but basically going a little bit deeper on certain themes that are uh, at the center of the book and build them up with the, with the people, you know. So it's a, it's a truly uh, sort of uh, uh, participatory writing process that I'm trying to, to establish. Okay. And uh, at that specific event, Eurovision, we are going to explore uh, the importance of building European narratives uh, and the importance of, of building European narratives uh, uh, within the frame of uh, arts, fiction, politics or journalism. And that is the kind of contamination I wanted to bring and this is probably what makes this event quite unique comparing to other events that they are here in Brussels about the same topic. There are a lot of events, especially now with the 60th anniversary of the Treaty of Rome, we had a lot of, uh, a lo a lot of uh, seminars about what is the future of Europe, what is a narrative for Europe. This is a little bit different because uh, I'm trying to put together artists that are working on right. uh, the actual narratives, uh, politicians that are actually uh, uh, operating and, and, and living and implementing the narratives. Uh, in uh, on a daily level, and uh, and some more like kind of more political theorists that will bring this in a more metaphysical level and uh, and explore a little bit more about this idea of uh, a post nation uh, state. Okay, I think the lineup you managed to to bring together is quite interesting, and uh, I mean I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to being at the event. So I will post all the details about the event on, on the Facebook page. All the details about Giuseppe and uh, let's see let's see what happens I will send a reminder uh, before the event takes place Giuseppe thank you very much thank you to you <laughs> it was a pleasure <laughs> so let's see where this brings us and uh, best of luck best of luck with your book and with your event thanks a lot we're closing the live right now and uh, see, you. see you next time